Good morning and welcome, friends. Um, every Sunday, the slot meets uh, at 11 a.m. for a discussion of um, topics that are of interest to uh, philosophical students as well as world at large. Um, today's um, meeting is a special one. We are commemorating and celebrating William Kwan Judge's life and work. Um, he was one of the original founders of the Theosophical Movement, and after his meeting with HPB, he steadfastly, diligently, without any uh, turning from the uh, master's program or the teacher, continued till the end of his life, until the 45th year of his life uh, with the movement, and he has left to us a tremendous amount of literature, 200 publications in all, so that we may find it. Uh, his advice and his general counsel is in all of those publications and letters. So first there will be readings, uh, and then uh, we will have a biographical talk. Good morning. This reading is from the from an epitome of theosophy. Theosophy, the wisdom religion, has existed from immemorial time. It offers us a theory of nature and of life which is founded upon knowledge acquired by the sages of the past, more especially those of the East. And its higher students claim that this knowledge is not imagined or inferred, but that it is a knowledge of facts seen and known by those who are willing to comply with the conditions requisite for seeing and knowing. Theosophy, meaning knowledge of or about God, not in the sense of a personal anthropomorphic God, but in that of divine godly wisdom, and the term God being universally accepted as including the whole of both, the known and the unknown. It follows that theosophy must imply wisdom respecting the absolute. And since the Absolute is without beginning and eternal, this wisdom must have existed always. Hence, Theosophy is sometimes called the Wisdom Religion, because from immemorial time it has had knowledge of all the laws governing the spiritual, the moral, and the material. The theory of nature and of life which it offers is not one that was at first speculatively laid down, and then proved by adjusting facts or conclusions to fit it, but is an explanation of existence, cosmic and individual, derived from knowledge reached by those who have acquired the power to see behind the curtain that hides the operations of nature from the ordinary mind. Such beings are called sages, using the term in its highest sense. Of, le of late, they have been called Mahatmas and Adepts. They are known to have lived in all parts of the globe in, ob in obedience to cyclic laws. These cyclic laws operate in each age. In a cycle where all is ascending and descending, the adepts must wait until the time comes before they can aid the race to ascend. They cannot and must not interfere with karmic law. One of the fundamental propositions of theosophy is that the spirit in man is the only real and permanent part of his being, the rest of his nature being variously compounded. Further, the universe being one thing and not diverse, and everything within it being connected with the whole, and with every other thing therein, of which upon the upper plane there is a perfect knowledge. No act or thought occurs without each portion of the great whole perceiving and noting it. Hence, all are inseparably bound together by the tie of brotherhood. Now reading from the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Krishna, the devotee who is engaged in the right practice of his duties, approacheth the Supreme Spirit in no long time. Whoever in acting dedicates his actions to the Supreme Spirit and puts aside all selfish interests and the result is untouched by sin. 
even as the leaf of the lotus is unaffected by the waters. He is esteemed among all who, whether amongst his friends and companions, in the midst of enemies or those who stand aloof or remain neutral, with those who love and those who hate, and in the company of sinners or the righteous, is of equal mind. Of the sage, of self-centered heart, at rest and free from attachment to desires, the simile is recorded. As a lamp which is sheltered from the wind flickereth not. Arjuna, O slayer of Madhu, on account of the restless of the mind, I do not perceive any possibility of steady continuance in this yoga of equanimity which thou hast declared. For indeed, O Krishna, the mind is full of agitation, turbulent, strong, and obstinate. I believe the restraint of it to be as difficult as that of the wind. Krishna. Without doubt, O oh, oh thou of might arms, the mind is restless and hard to restrain, but it may be restrained by practice and absence of desire. In my opinion, this divine discipline is very difficult for one who hath not his soul in his own control, yet it may be acquired through proper means and by one who is assiduous and controlled in his heart. Arjuna. What end, O Krishna, doth the man attain who, although having faith, hath not attained to perfection his devotion, because his unsubdued mind wandered from the discipline? Doth he, fallen from both, like a broken cloud without any support, become destroyed, O strong-armed one, being deluded in the path of the Supreme Spirit? Thou, Krishna, shouldst completely dispel this doubt for me. For there is none other to be found able to remove it. Krishna. Such a man doth not perish here or hereafter. For never to an evil place goeth one who doeth good. The man whose devotion has been broken off by death goeth to the regions of the righteous, where he dwells for an immensity of years, and is then born again on earth in a pure and fortunate family. Or even in a family of those who are spiritually illuminated. But such a rebirth into this life as this last is more difficult to obtain. Being thus born again, he becomes in contact with the knowledge which belonged to him in his former body, and from that time he struggles more diligently toward perfection, O son of Guru. For even unwittingly, by reason of that last practice, he is led and works on. Even if only a mere inquirer, he reaches beyond the word of the Vedas, but the devotee who is striving with all his might obtaineth perfection because of efforts continued through many births goeth to the supreme goal. Even if the man of most evil ways worship me with exclusive devotion, he is to be considered as righteous, for he hath judged aright. Such a man soon becometh of a righteous soul, and obtaineth perpetual happiness. I swear, O son of Kunti, that he who worships me never perisheth. This reading is from letters that have helped me by uh, Mr. Judge. It is natural for one to ask, what of the future and what of the defined object, if any, for our work? That can be answered in many ways. There is first our one work, in and on ourselves, each one, that has for its object the enlightenment of oneself for the good of others. If that is pursued selfishly, some enlightenment comes, but not the amount needed for the whole work. We have to watch ourselves so as to make of each center from which, in our measure, may flow out the potentialities for good, and that from the adept come in large and affluent stream. The future then 
for each will come from each present moment. As we use the moment, so we shift the future up or down for good or ill. The future being only a word for the present not yet come. We have to see to the present more than all. If the present is full of doubt or vacillation, so will be the future. If full of confidence, calmness, hope, courage, and intelligence, thus also will be the future. As to the broader scope of the work, that comes from united effort of the whole mass of units. It embraces the race, and as we cannot escape from the destiny of the race, we have to dismiss doubt and continue work. The race is a whole in a transition state, and many of its units are kept back by the condition of the whole. We find the path difficult because being of the race, the general race tendencies very strongly affect us. This we cannot do away with in a moment. It is useless to groan over it. It is also selfish since we in the distant past had a hand in making it what it is now. The only way we can alter it is by such action now as make, makes of each, of each one of us a center for good, a force that makes for righteousness and that is guided by wisdom. From the great power of the general business, we each one have a greater fight to wage. The moment we force our inner nature up beyond the dead level of the world. So before we attempt that forcing, we should on the lower plane accumulate all that we can of merit by unselfish acts, by kind thoughts, by, detach, by detaching our minds from the allurements of the world. This will not throw us out of the world, but will make us free from the great force of the unconsciousness and material basis of our nature. That material base, being devoid of soul, is more inclined on this plane to the lower things of life than to the higher. We're not working for some definite organization of the new years to come, but for a change in the manas and booty of the race. That is why it may seem indefinite, but it is nevertheless very defined and very great in scope. The masters have written that we are all bound together in one living whole. Hence the thoughts and acts of one react upon all. It is not high learning that is needed, but solely devotion to humanity, faith and masters and the higher self, a comprehension of the fundamental truths of theosophy and a little, only a little, sincere attempt to pre present these fundamental truths to a people who are in desperate need of them. That attempt should be continuous. William Kwan Judge was born on April 13, 1851, 
and he passed out of his physical body on March 21, 1896. He was born in Dublin, Ireland. Both of his parents were Irish. Uh, his mother, Alice Mary, uh, died during his uh, her um, seventh childbirth. Uh, his father uh, was Frederick Judge, um, who decided to emigrate with his children to the United States uh, when Judge was about 13 years of age. I think we all have heard that William had suffered a severe illness when he was about seven and the doctor announced him amidst grieving parents dead but suddenly uh, breathing started and the child um, started to recover, breathe and uh, became well again. It, we find him in his eighth year the same but yet other. Uh, this uh, change is very uh, noticeable in him because um, his parents did not even know that the kid had ever learned to read. But after he recovered, <coughs> we find him interested in religion, magic, Rosicrucianism, and he, he is devouring all of the books he can get his hands on, mesmerism, character reading, phrenology, and parts of the Bible. He's trying to figure out what exactly the Bible is saying. Um, there is a um, article uh, in letters that have helped me that Mr. Judge wrote himself, and the title of that is In a Borrowed Body. And it is quite useful actually to read it because I think he really is telling us who, who he really is that is occupying this body at seven years of age um, in, because the title is In a Borrowed Body. Uh, we all know that uh, in occult world, uh, those things do occur when a saint or a um, Muni or a beneficent human being is coming into incarnation to help all those in need of it borrows a body that is available for um, occupancy. And I think you can all benefit from reading that article yourselves. Um, we find uh, Mr. Judge uh, studying uh, law. Uh, in about 68, 1868 to 71. In 1872, he becomes a naturalized citizen and he's admitted to the bar of New York. In 1874, he gets married to Ella Smith of Bridland and they uh, start their residence there and they live there until 1893 when they move to uh, New York City for Mr. Judge to be close to his work as well as to the Theosophical uh, society's headquarters. Um, when they got married, a child was, a daughter was born to them uh, shortly thereafter, but uh, the child got ill uh, in infancy and uh, passed away because of diphtheria. Then Ms. Mr. Judge is trying to find a, an answer to this and uh, we find him studying modern spiritualism during that period of his life and after reading um, uh, Olcott's um, article in the newspaper, uh, he contacts, uh, uh, the, that article was um, uh, from the other world, the occult world, and we find uh, Mr. Judge uh, contacting Olcott and asking him for the name of a medium. Olcott says, well, I don't know any, but I have a friend whom you might like to meet, and so in uh, 18... 74, this meeting uh, is arranged and Judge meets um, HPV in Irving Street uh, residence and that was the beginning of his uh, introduction to HPV, to Theosophy, to the occult teachings. Uh, uh, when he becomes a uh, chela, uh, he's trained with Olcott in the um, 
with Olke, the uh, president of the society later on, uh, by HPB, uh, in uh, teaching them how to differentiate between knowledge and the knowledge of the invisible planes of being uh, versus uh, mediumship, when that ability is not controlled by the medium, but it just comes and goes at its own uh, merit, so to speak. Um, Mr. Judge then um, uh, helps inaugurate the uh, social, uh, the uh, Theosophical Society in uh, 1875 in New York. Uh, 76, we find him traveling to Mexico, Venezuela, uh, to uh, Central and South America, and it is during one of these travels that uh, he catches Chakra's uh, fever, which kind of plagued him for the rest of his, the duration of his stay uh, on Earth. Um, HPV publishes the Isis Unveiled, which Judge helped with his brother John to uh, put it in order, and then she and um, Olka leave for India the next year in 78, so Mr. Judge is left um, in the States to carry on with the work of the uh, Theosophical uh, Movement, and uh, we see him determined and steadfast um, at his post. He never abandons it. He is uh, trying to make every opportunity that comes his way an opportunity to spread it. In 1883, he launches um, the Aryan Theosophical Society branch of the movement, and again uh, in 1884 he leaves for India uh, by way of um, Europe. Uh, he comes back uh, to the United States, uh, and in 1886 he launches The Path, which is one of his uh, publications uh, that he contributed under different uh, pen names for the rest of the duration. Um, from then on, uh, we, we uh, find him steadfastly working at his post. This also gives us an opportunity to see that he is being left on his own to experience life, to get experience in disseminating this philosophy, uh, to understand the occult laws uh, that uh, he was taught on his own, doing his own experiments. So he's being prepared for a larger part of that work during this period of his life. So who is William Kwan Judge uh, or what is he? We uh, are all aware that recognition of those who pass from this field of uh, life uh, made a factor in uh, the spiritual life. The outer world is seen in many religious observances like the Chinese in ancestor worship, uh, in India as Pitri worship, the fathers, among the ancient uh, Iranians as the uh, forefather worship, and of course for the Christian world, All Saints Day. So then we come to find out that there are personalities, men and women, who having lived an incarnate existence, have merged themselves in the consciousness of the race to which they belong, or in the consciousness of the institutions for which they lived and labored. Such men then are not really personalities, they're ideas. They are institutions. They cannot be separated from the great field of their activities, or banished from the emotions, feelings, reasonings of those whom they energize, for whom they live, and working for whom they also died. In their very death they live on, for ideas are immortal, and sacrifice or service never dies. Just as we cannot think of drama without thinking of Shakespeare, or Buddhism without thinking of Buddha, no more can we think of the Theosophical movement of the 19th century without bringing to our hearts and minds three great heroic figures. One, H.P. Blavatsky, who brought that message 
and embodied it in her life of service and to others who perform the task, one in Eastern land and the other one in Western. Damodar Malamankar in the East and William Quan Judge in the West. Damodar was a Brahmi. He was born uh, in India, took his the karma of his caste, lived it, fulfilled it, until the moment once again became submerged in superstition and the religious apathy that prevailed in India. But Mr. Judge's story is inspiring. Who was he? What was he? After all, who can say who, who a man is? Who can say who an occultist is? Those who are chelas will not speak, and those who speak are not chelas. But we can look at his at his life, Mr. Judge's life. He came to HPV as a young man, gave up everything that was in the eyes of the world great, a career, name, fame, power to lead, and became one of the three founders of the Theosophical Movement. And as we said, when two, HPV and Alfred went away in 1878, he remained at his post, submerged in the darkness of the Western world. He struggled, kept the light burning in the world, however dim. Through the tradition, he began teaching uh, after he began learning. Learning in the great school of life, learning the right and suitable ways and methods of promulgating the great teachings which had come to the Western Hemisphere for the first time in the history of the Western culture. Now, when we look at our historical records, we find that um, since the 14th century, which was started with Tsongkhapa, uh, the uh, reincarnation of Buddha, according to HPV's writings, um, the Western world gets illuminated uh, through efforts which are secret and private. The movements of 15th, 16th, 17th and 18th centuries are embedded in secret so societies and organizations. So then all the students guided by the light within came out from among the dead in the world of the dead, quietly one by one, retired into the world of the living. But the 19th century movement was very different in nature. Those who guided the movement from the beginning, the masters of wisdom, had taken on themselves the heavy burden of making that movement public, launching their message into a criticizing world, part antagonistic, the other part materialistic, part steeped in superstition and bigoted religions. So to such a world then, the message came in that mysterious personality called H. P. Blavatsky. And then to her came Judge and began his career. Of the very few, only two of her pupils remained a steadfast to their mission and their life to the very end and merged themselves in the movement. And these two, as we said, were Damodar and Judge. But they are no longer personalities. Judge is not a personality, an American, an official of anybody or organization. He's an idea. He's an institution. So, let us study the movement today and look at the life of him whose tradition we inherit and whose work we try with intelligence to carry on. If the work and teachings of Judge taught us to follow him because there was some mystery about it, if it demanded a blind faith and blinder following, judge would lead us astray. But to proceed from his teachings and the fulfillment of his mission to what he was would be to understand him fully. Enough for us to get the proof positive 
that he was a link in the chain, an endless chain that stretches far back into the night of time. The chain that binds all disciples all over the world in all ages and climes. Disciples who in incarnations do not stray away, who stand true to the charge, who attacked, attack not in return, who do not give up standing at their posts because of attacks or hatred heaped on them. Therein lies the test of judge as a true disciple. Shall we accept him as a disciple of 13 years of standing because HPB says so? And let us see what HPB tells us. This is some of the things HPB wrote in regard to judge. Quotation, all of it is in quotation marks. He has been a part of myself for eons past. I ask no one to help or defend me, but judge's case is different and more difficult of proof or disproof. William Kuan Judge is the Antaskarana, the bridge between the two Manasas, the American thought and the Indian, or rather the Trans-Himalayan esoteric knowledge. He is the resuscitator of theosophy in the United States and is working to the best of his means and ability and at a great sacrifice for the spread of the movement. My dearest brother and co-founder of the Theosophical Society. We were several to call it to life in 1875. Since then, you have remained alone to preserve that life through good and evil report. It is to you chiefly, if not entirely, that the Theosophical Society owes its existence in 1888. I ask you also to remember that on this important occasion, my voice is but the feeble echo of other more sacred voices and the transmitter of the approval of those whose presence is alive in more than one true theosophical heart and lives, I know, preeminently in yours. So HPB had absolutely and complete trust in Mr. Judge uh, from friend, a student, to uh, the promulgator of true philosophy, uh, he remains with the teacher. So should we accept these statements on face value? Or is there another way to also uh, check this uh, truth for ourselves? And we know, of course, that HPB being the uh, direct agent of the masters and bringing this uh, tremendous philosophy into the West is totally reliable in what she says. But it is also uh, important that we can verify th these things for ourselves and not take them as given to us by others, regardless who is giving it. The true messengers and the true chalas may be known by the immemorial gauge. And what is that gauge? First, it is consistency. Are there contradictions to be found when the epitome and the ocean are put side by side? When all the articles that judge wrote in the path are put side by side with all the letters that he wrote to all of his co-workers is he found to be consistent. It is within our power to test out the consistency of judge as that of other writers, other authors. Again, was judge consistent with the spiritual consistency of other spiritual disciples and students? But still more, was he consistent in his teachings 
not only with the teachings of HBB, but with those of all true students of occultism, all the spiritual teachers down the ages. If he is not, he's a false teacher. If HPV is not consistent, she is also a false teacher. This is the test which lies within our own power to apply, the measuring rod with which white adepts, who are masters of compassion, have armed seekers of truth. Can the compassionate ones be conceived of as living humanity in the Lord without a proper gate or measure whereby that humanity, who at this stage in their development, incapable of standing face to face with the masters, can find out for themselves who are the true representatives of the masters. If this is the policy of the masters, then we can know it. They gave the gauge to test the messenger in the light of the message, immortal and immemorial. Judges stands that test, and so it is that to us, who had not the honor of knowing him physically, the judge becomes real, more real than most people known in the physical world by connecting their personalities. Because those who knew him when he was on earth have nothing but wonderful things to say about Mr. Judge. In one place it is stated, uh, quotation, I left early for my job so that I could walk with Mr. Judge because he gave so much encouragement to people in his daily um, uh, associations with them. Uh, another says, I went to the lodge for the meetings to listen to theosophical talks, but I couldn't understand much of anything that was said until Mr. Judge took, took to the platform and <laughs> she says, then the talk was heavenly. I could understand all of it. So definitely there had to be some influence in him uh, that addressed all those uh, who came to him uh, for their needs. But we can get to know him too through his work. So it says, let us become like judge. Therein lies an aspect of practicing theosophy and not an impossible achievement. What is the use of all the sacrifice that he made, all the strength that he showed, if it cannot inspire us as a living fact and as a living force? Judge is not dead. He is living in more than one sense. Not only does he live as all men live after death because they are immortal, but he lives as an inspiring force in the world of the heart, where all the spiritual teachers live. In the world of universality, in the sphere of impersonality, judge lives on. To become like judge is to embody his message, is to follow the path which he walked. His walking is assured us that we too can walk. If one of us can do it, all of us can do it. He may have walked a long distance in one incarnation. He was what he was, and we are what we are. But the difference between us is a difference only in degree and not in kind. And in our work, how shall we follow judge? Can we not check ourselves up every time we write? every time we speak or act or think or feel by what judge did under similar circumstances. We said uh, that he left 200 publications. Can we not take the trouble to verify the correctness of our ideas and statements by what the great messengers or the true chalas have written? The immemorial philosophy has not escaped a new fact of life to be revealed by us. All that humanity lives in each century is a repetition of the previous one. 
And so however original our idea may appear to be, if we follow judge, we can take care if it dovetails in, checks up, tallies with these immemorial teachings, we can always look for precedents, asking every time if such a procedure is right in the light of those who have proven themselves. We sometimes forget that we are in the process of proving ourselves, checking ourselves in the light of the actions of the great teachers is to follow those teachers, to follow because we, we have taken the time and we have proven them out. Let those who complain that such is a worship of ideas or an institution modify their meaning of the term. Right worship is the attempt to make ourselves worthy of relationship with those ideas and institutions. What does a true Buddhist mean when he says, I worship the Buddha? He's saying, I want to make myself worthy of relationship with the Buddha. When we say, let us make ourselves worthy of relationship with this, that, or the other spiritual teacher, we express the wish to follow in their footsteps, doing what they did, trying to do what they did, recognizing wherein we fail, accepting the failure with humility, and picking ourselves up to go forward with confidence. The quality and position of judge are evidenced first by the capacity to work alone. And we mentioned this. When Olcott and HPV left for India, he was left on his own from 1879 to 1884, and who stood alone, waited and worked in silence and in darkness in the United States. Colleagues and friends dropped off one by one, and he was all alone. Then after preparing himself for the higher, uh, his mission in other words, going to India, making his contacts there, and returning, all of a sudden, as if a bolt from the blue had fallen, the springs up in this land of America, a wonderful magazine. He had the capacity of the architect to work alone, to plan before the masons came to the building of the temple. Second, judge had that ability to utilize not only the powers and virtues of those who came to him, but their weaknesses, their blemishes. He taught them how to overcome their weaknesses and make use of them all by giving them opportunity. That is, I think, a real gauge of a chilla. He made room in his big plan for their smaller plans, and even though he might not approve wholly of the plans of his associates, he would suggest or question, but let them fi find out for themselves. He had a sense of humor, was even at times sarcastic and sometimes a sketchy. He knew how to be all things to all men, not by flattery, but by giving to each according to the need of that particular person. So the perfect knowledge of the masters enabled them to give in beauty, in patience and sweetness, or in strength and silence of speech to each according not only to his desert, but also to his betterment. All the important incidents of judge's life embody the teaching. Every time he acted, he acted in terms of the immemorial message. So the great incidents of his life are landmark, principles on which we may rest. In that light, examine his activities since the time of passing of HPV, the position he took in London in 1894, his behavior in 1895. In that light, look at his death, not as an incident of his own life, but the life of the Theosophical movement of the 19th century. 
in the putting away of that body on the significant of significant day of March 21. What is March 21? It's the vernal equinox. There's a message in it. The anniversary of passing of HPB is 40 days later. And there's a message in that too. It is a strange coincidence that in the ancient rituals and ceremonials, there is the feast of the spring equinox. And to this day, the Iranians have a festival on that day. It is their new year and they celebrate it. And 40 days thereafter, another feast, um, when all that has been gathered of the first fruits of the spring were offered to the gods. What does HPB tell us in the secret doctrine? She says, make thy calculations of Lanu. So the life and labor and death of this the judge are incidents in the movement which in which we too are factors. It is our movement as, ma as much as the judges. He made a tremendous sacrifice. Shall we not now take the advice that HPB gave the Theosophists of her day? Shall we not do as HPB did, work for the restitution of borrowed robes and the vindication of glorious but calumniated reputations? Judge work for the restitution of borrowed robes, so far as HPB was concerned. He worked for the vindication of, of her good name when it was attacked. He advised his co-workers not to indulge in Blavatskyanism in and out of season, but he preached the doctrine and practi practiced it in his own life. Then, then our task becomes to study, to practice, to promulgate the, mis the message that HPV brought which judge explained as best he could to the western mind to the western world so that judge's name may be honored wherever it has been dishonored not for his sake but ours only as that is done do we follow the path of the predecessors So William Kwan, Judge's place is unique as is HPB's. She brought the divine plan of the world movement straight from the great association of the architects. But she had in Judge her master builder, who understood the plan and went on with the work, directing the raising of the pillars where and how the plan called, ever mindful of the great uses which the building was intended to subserve. He saw the plan of the founders of this Republic of Brotherhood once more taking form, and he inaugurated the new era of Western occultism in leading men to practice and apply in daily and hourly, living the brotherhood of each they love to drink. He set men the example, not of blind following, but of unqualified loyalty to a proven teaching and a teacher in human form, the link with the divine. He knew the whole plan. He knew who sent it and brought it. He followed it over hot plowshares even to death. As others know the work of William Kwan Judge, they too will see the plan. So that it becomes very clear that there is a plan uh, that the masters initiated the movement uh, for the benefit not just of the 19th and 20th, 20th centuries but also for the 20th, 21st. Now in this uh, era of the 21st we are now in the Aquarian age. This era is that of compassion, universality, internationalism when humanity is to come a one family. So it behooves us to fit ourselves into, the, into this work. And those who love HPB 
as master's representative with love, William Cohen judged because one cannot be separated from the other, uh, neither can the both of them be separated from the master's lodge because they came from that lodge as representative into the world and they left this uh, tremendous uh, uh, literature, uh, this philosophy uh, for our benefit. Uh, as we said, he left 200 publications. Ocean of Theosophy gives a, gives a condensed version of uh, Secret Doctrine. For those who find it difficult to start with the Secret Doctrine, Ocean of, uh, Ocean of uh, Theosophy is a great uh, work. He has an epitome of, the, uh, of this philosophy for uh, Theosophy. Um, he did uh, the transliteration of the Gita. He wrote Patanjali's Yoga Aphorisms for our benefit. So those of us interested in meditation can go to that book. So this um, philosophy is very expansive. Uh, it is always in the world from immemorial time. It never disappears from the world. For those who have eyes and can see it, it's there. And for those who are searching, uh, we hope that they find uh, this philosophy because it truly feeds the soul. Um, this uh, is very... Uh, enlightening in a way, so we'll quote a few of these. His writings were simple, accessible to simple minds, without much regard for form. That is why those of his own day and our day, intellectuals, devoted to form, failed, and failed today too, to perceive the depth and substance in them, because all of his writings are very substantial. To him, outer form and ceremony were sham, play for children, but exact fulfillment of every item of inner procedure was the natural law of life. That is why those of his own day and our day gaze fixed on passing show fail and fail still to recognize him. He was an occultist. That is why to every counterfeit occultist within the theosophical area, William Juan Judge is an anathema. The mere mention of his name arouses their opposition. It was so in his day, and it is also today. What kind of a being must he have been, must he indeed be, whose living force was and is such a catalytic agent? <coughs> catalytic agent. Time will disclose, for the many, his day is yet not come, because we really don't know who he is. His place yet to be understood in the future, but to one here and there, the few, his nature is unfolding, for occultists are being found, fostered, and prepared against the time when power will be needed and pretense will go for naught. So it is important to keep that in mind that in this philosophy uh, there is no dormancy, that it is a living philosophy. Um, the studying of the philosophy, trying to uh, assemble its knowledge within ourselves to understand it, and then once we uh, accumulate that, to give it as we found it, is a struggle that each student of theosophy goes through. But in that struggle, HPV assures us that we find uh, the answer uh, to understanding the philosophy. Because the struggle uh, activates the centers in us which um, come into forefront uh, in the student's life, and that is the expression of the higher mind, 
which the Western for world does not even acknowledge as existing, but Patanjali's yo yoga aphorisms will never become real to us until that higher mind is activated. And the other quality necessary to understand this work is intuition. So with that uh, activated, as we move along the path, we can understand more and more. And as we understand more, we can also assimilate more and we can also disseminate that philosophy in its simple form as it was given to us. So those who want to honor Mr. Judge can follow the path, apply as he applied the message, work as he worked, live and love as he lived and loved, so the message may spread and avert the catastrophe which threatens to overtake the world. And indeed, if we look around, we see the pockets of enlightenment, but we see a, a, a lot of um, negativity going on. If our objective is to become one family worldwide and internationalism, then we need to uh, be able to understand and disseminate this philosophy as it was given to us. Um, Mr. Judge's last words, there must be calmness Hold fast, go slow. As said, he left his uh, physical body March 21, 1896, and two days later he was cremated in Rhoda.